Hi there. My name is Jenny Duggan, and I'm a professor in wildlife biology at California State University, Monterey Bay. I'm also a member of the SquirrelNet team. In this video, I'm going to talk about the telemetry module, which is one of SquirrelNet's more advanced modules. In this module, you're going to learn how to track a radio collared squirrel through a study area. The ability to radio track animals and then interpret that location data that you collect from the tracked animals, those are really valuable skills in wildlife biology and other related fields. We can use the information from tracked animals to learn a lot about the animal's habitat preferences, the habitat suitability, and even the connectivity um, of the landscape for those animals. And that, of course, helps us make decisions in the world of management. So in this video, I'm going to go through three things, really. First, I'll introduce you to the radio telemetry equipment. Then I'll walk you through the process of tracking a radio collared squirrel using homing. And then third, we'll talk about the data you'll be collecting once you've tracked your radio collared squirrel. Now I'm referring to squirrels because this is squirrel net, but you don't actually have to have radio collared squirrels to use this module. If your instructor or people your instructor works with have placed radio collars on some other type of animal, that's absolutely fine. You can still use those animals um, and track those animals with this module. So I think that's everything we need to get started. Let's go. Okay, so let's talk about VHF radio telemetry equipment. VHF stands for very high frequency. So we need transmitters that can emit signals at those very high frequencies. Our transmitters will look something like this when they are shipped to us in the mail. We can see we've got three transmitters here tucked into the styrofoam. And then our company has also sent one transmitter that's already styled as a radio collar. So what that means is that we have the radio transmitter itself and a cable tie has been put through the radio transmitter. There are holes on either side of it and a rubber tube has been cut to size and placed over the cable tie so that the whole thing will be a little bit more comfortable for an animal to wear. Now, once this is on an animal, we'll cut the end of the cable tie off that would just get in the way. And then we have the actual antenna on the transmitter. That's what is really emitting the signal from the transmitter where the signal is created and where the, the battery is powering everything. Now, an animal would easily chew this off if we left it like this. And so I typically tuck that into this tubing uh, around the animal's neck, maybe um, in a couple of loops, um, and hope that there's just a little bit remaining sticking out that the animal won't really be able to reach and chew off. Remember, if the animal chewed this off, we would have a really hard time picking up the signal um, emitted from this transmitter. You've maybe noticed that this didn't have a big yellow thing on it, like these transmitters do. Um, that yellow thing is actually a piece of tape that had been holding a magnet on the transmitter. So on the tape, we see the radio frequency. That radio frequency is also on the transmitter itself. And the reason we had this shipped to us with a magnet on it is that the magnet um, keeps the battery unpowered. The, this is not actually activated and transmitting a signal until we remove the magnet from it. So when you're ready to do that, um, before you actually release your animal, um, you'll want to uh, give this a little shake, make sure it gets started, turn your receiver on, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, and make sure that this actually is emitting a signal before it's totally placed on the animal and the animal's off and running and gone. Now the next thing we want to look at is our antenna. So this is a three element holding Yagi antenna. This is one of the more common antennas used by researchers. So it's folded currently. I will unfold it. So I'm um, using these little bolts here to tighten up the arms into the correct positions. Okay. And you can see, this is 
what the antenna looks like once it's been unfolded into the correct position. Now, on one end, we have a rubber handle. Some people argue that you should always hold this rubber handle um, and not hold the antenna in the center like this, particularly if your uh, signal is somewhat weak it's possible that your hand would interrupt that signal as it's received by the antenna and make it harder for you to track your animal. I don't know if that's really been tested very rigorously or not, um, but it can't hurt to just use the handle as intended. Um, the reason people sometimes don't use the handle is that it's a little bit more work than holding the antenna in the center like this. Um, and if you're spending hours in the field tracking the animals, you know, that's going to take a little strength. You'll want to switch hands every now and then, but that's good to work up that strength. Our antenna has a cable attachment here, and that cable goes from here to the receiver, and those coupled together are really what are going to enable you to pick up the signal from your transmitters. So let's take a look at the receiver. This radio receiver is what we combine with the antenna to pick up signals from the transmitters. So the antenna is plugged in with the cord right here with the ANT. And then we can turn the power on. So there's an on off toggle right here. And you can see the screen has lit up when I turned that on. So I'll leave that on. Close to the on switch, we have the audio, so the volume. If I turn that up a little bit, you hear a little bit of background noise. Okay, but I'll keep it down for now. So if we focus on the numbers on this screen, that is referring to the frequency that's currently being received by the receiver. So it's the frequency of the transmitter that we were trying to track. So this receiver accepts frequencies in the range of 150 to 151.999 MHz. We can confirm that by looking at the side here. Under our case, we have a sticker that has our model and our serial number, and then also the frequency range. So to search for frequencies in the 150s, we actually take this bypass toggle and set it on low. Okay. If we want to search for frequencies in the 151s, then we put that back on high. And you can see that one reappears. Now the rest of the frequency is still shown on the screen. So the full frequency we're looking for here is 151.012. The 012 are entered into the receiver using these dials. So we have a zero, a one, and a two. And it's easy enough to turn those dials to change the frequencies that we're looking for. We also have a dial over here that gives us a scan rate. I usually leave that at a beep every two seconds. And then the last thing I'll show you is the gain button over by the audio. So the gain is basically the sensitivity of your receiver to pick up your signal, but then all other sounds as well. So usually when you first start tracking your colored animal, you're going to turn this up quite a bit. And so you notice you're picking up a lot of background noise. Let me turn this down. Not only have you increased your sensitivity to the particular frequency that you're searching for, you've also increased your sensitivity to other things and you get all of that background noise. Now that's fine when you're first trying to just pick up a signal and you don't know where it's going to be, but as you decrease that gain and get closer and closer to your animal, you're going to increase your ability to distinguish between the background noise and the signal that you're homing in on. Once you're ready to track your radio colored squirrel, you'll want to take the radio frequency that was on that squirrel's transmitter and enter it into your telemetry receiver. Then you'll turn your receiver on, turn up the audio and the gain, and hold the antenna high above your head, 
rotating or scanning in all directions around you. You may not actually hear that signal or the beeping sounds in the first place that you're standing. You might need to walk around a little bit and you might even need to find a higher spot like on top of a hill before you can actually pick up that signal. Once you do find the signal, you might notice that you can hear it at a range of angles from where you're standing. You'll want to listen for where that signal is the loudest and head in that direction. Now, if you can't really distinguish where the signal is the loudest, you'll want to turn your gain down. That should help you by decreasing kind of the sensitivity um, to picking up that signal. Hopefully, it will lead you to some kind of sign for the animal that you're looking for. It could be the animal itself that you see, but it might also just be a burrow or a tree where you would likely find the animal um, if you looked a little bit more closely. Now, this process doesn't always go easily. Um, if you're in a location with a lot of hills, especially steep hills um, or human structures, the signal, the radio signals, may bounce around a little bit and you might end up walking around in circles trying to track down where that signal is the loudest. That takes a little bit of practice, learning how to deal with that bouncing around, um, but keep at it. You will probably figure it out eventually. Once you've tracked your radio collared squirrel to its location, then you can take a moment to enter data on that individual. You might have either hard copies of the data sheet you see in front of you, or a Google Form version that you can pull up on your smartphone. Once you are ready to enter your data, you'll notice there are a few different categories that need to be addressed. So you'll need information on your observer. You are the observer. Uh, information on the location that you tracked the animal to, and that will include a latitude and longitude um, that is noted in decimal degrees to five places. And if you don't have access to a GPS unit, you might want to use some kind of GPS app on a smartphone. The SquirrelNet YouTube channel has a video tutorial on how to use the Gaia GPS app, so that's probably worth checking out. You'll also need information on the habitat type you're working in and the proximity of the tracked location to the nearest edge, and that is basically the boundary between two different habitat types. You'll want proximity of the tracked location to safety, or what is perceived as safety by your focal animal. So if it's a tree squirrel, that would be a tree. If it's a ground squirrel, that's probably a burrow. And then you also want proximity of that location to human structures. For information on the focal animal, you'll want the radio frequency that's on its collar, um, as well as the species of the animal, and then confidence in having tracked it to the correct location. So did you get a visual on that animal or not, for example. You'll also want to record whether any other animals are present within 30 meters of the tracked location. So are there conspecifics, uh, individuals of the same species? Are there humans other than you, the observer? Or are there any dogs in the area? And then finally, you'll need just a little bit of information on current tracking conditions. So the date, the time, the weather, and anything in your environment that may have made tracking a little bit more difficult, like topography and the presence of human structures. So students contribute the data that they collect from their radio collared squirrels to a national data set so that then students across the country have a much larger data set to work with. So you and all of these other students will then be able to address much broader hypotheses about the space use and movement of these radio colored animals and whether they differ across species or habitats or whatever else you're interested in. If you're testing hypotheses about the space use and movement of radio colored squirrels, your instructors will probably provide you with instructions on how to map those locations or estimate the sizes of home ranges. If you're interested in learning more about SquirrelNet, you can visit our webpage at squirrelnet.org. And feel free to stop by the discussion forums and say hi to other students participating in SquirrelNet projects. Thank you so much for participating.
We really hope you have fun. Happy squirreling. Go nuts.